I'm just going to start with acknowledgements because I think it's important that you understand that I'm probably not the best person to be giving this presentation. Jay Ogilvie, who is a research associate at UNB, has been working, done the majority of this work on the wet areas mapping model over the last decade. He has a little newborn, and so he was hesitant to leave the, uh, New Brunswick. Uh, Barry uh, White, my boss, and uh, Jay Ogilvie and Paul Arp are the three collaborators on the wet areas mapping project, and they've been working together for the last decade. So I'm really presenting this on behalf of them. I don't want to uh, dive too much into policy, but I want to point out that the work we do in forest management branch all of the decisions we make are fundamentally, we hope, informed by science. So what, the, what I'm going to be talking about today is one of, the, one of the data sets that we can use, we hope, to make better decisions to be stewards of uh, the forest resources of the province. So briefly, I'll skip probably the LIDAR introduction that, that's been done. Uh, I will talk about wet areas mapping, and I'm going to talk at a really low level. I think Nicholas was up at the 10,000 foot level, and I'll be down in the trenches with with it. And then I will talk very briefly about an offshoot of some of the work we've done. It's a, called a spill tool. So I'll just touch very briefly a couple slides on that. So Nicholas mentioned LIDAR has been around for almost half a century. Uh, at least lasers, uh, lasers have. And uh, what really made this possible, the, the, uh, that we can s scan the forest the way we do, is actually the co-evolution of the three technologies, the laser, but also uh, GPS, kinematic GPSs, which give you accuracies within centimeters of where an aircraft is in space, and an inertial measurement uni unit, which gives you the pitch, roll, and yaw of, of the platform. So, you know, it's X, Y, Z position, you know how it's oriented, you've got a laser firing 100,000 pulses per second, and that's how we can start to get these decimeter accuracies when we s and, and measure vegetation and terrain with incredible detail. So LIDAR is fundamentally a point cloud, and Nicholas alluded to this, but the laser that we use in most la applications is a near-infrared laser. So near-infrared lasers are really good for scanning vegetation. Vegetation is very bright in the near-infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and to use one of Nicholas's, ana Nicholas's analogies, if we could see near-infrared light, we need to wear welder's goggles when we walk through the forest. Uh, on the flip side, Near-infrared radiation is absorbed by water. So what I'm going to be talking about today, we're not going to, wet areas mapping is not a direct measurement of water. It's actually a modeling process. Water shows up as no data when you look at a LIDAR-derived DEM. So it's really important to keep in mind. We can directly measure vegetation height and structure. We cannot measure directly water. So everything I'm talking about today is, is a modeling. These are our two core data sets that we get, the two deliverables when we, we've spent $25 million on LIDAR, or $20 million on LIDAR, and uh, two of the key deliverables we get are a bare earth terrain model and a canopy height model, or a digital surface model in this case. Um, and these are the, most of the people in the GOA when they get LIDAR data, these are the two data sets they get. And these are also the two core data sets that the wet areas mapping model is based on. Wet areas mapping doesn't use the LiDAR point cloud. When we're doing forest inventory stuff that Nicholas talked about, then we use the point cloud. But for wet areas mapping, we just use these two one meter data sets. Nicholas also showed you examples of the 20 meter or 25 meter DEMs with LiDAR. Here we have the 25 meter DEM in the middle. This, uh, this on top is a 100 meter DEM, and that's the official GOA data set that we use for estimating terrain heights. So if you can imagine trying to make decisions about how you want to imagine, uh, manage the landscape with a 100 meter DEM versus LIDAR, it's really no contest. I don't want to, I, I want to be careful here though, there are applications, very legitimate applications for 100 meter DEMs. Fire behavior people love 100 meter DEMs because fires in their computer models progress across the landscape in a way that they feel is very natural. Um, if you're looking at the province, doing things at 100 meters can really save you a lot of time. You don't need to do everything at one meter. And we're actually, a lot of what I'll, I'll talk about today is the fact that it's very difficult to model things at one meter because it's just so much detail and so much information. And why do we love LIDAR? It's because, well, it, we point to a study that was done on, in Ontario by Tembeck. Uh, they found a few years ago that if they apply LIDAR to their whole value chain uh, from an industrial perspective, that pays for itself. You talk to forestry companies and the LIDAR terrain model 
pays for itself just by improving their, the efficiencies in road construction. I'm not a forester, I don't know anything about roads, but I take their word for it. Um, but again, as Nicholas mentioned, it does make it harder to adjust. If the number one driver for acquiring LIDAR is your digital elevation model, it does make it difficult to justify a second collection. So here I'll dive into wet areas mapping. I really want to just emphasize that the things we're trying to detect with wet areas mapping, the things we're trying to map, are very, very subtle uh, features on the terrain. And for us, it, fundamentally, they represent hydrological risk. You don't want to put a gigantic machine on them because the remediation cost would be horrific. And so these are things that aerial fo photo interpreters just literally cannot see when they're doing their job. So again, here's our coverage. I'll just touch base on the question around why we have very little LIDAR in the white area. The acquisition, the data that we're dealing with was purchased largely by Forest Management Branch, a little bit by the Alberta Energy Regulator, some by Parks. The white area is large, well, obviously is out of FMB's jurisdiction. I've had a lot of meetings with people in operations and things like that about um, buying LIDAR for the southern part of the province. Uh, in my opinion, I think if you guys want it, you should write a business case and go big or go home. I think you, I don't know if it can be done in this climate. It, obviously, we might have to wait three, five years, but I would say go buy it all. So that's all I have to say on that. I'll probably. <laughs> But what we did in forest management branch is really license it piece by piece as we could. And so, you know, it was uh, is very much a challenge now when you look at different acquisition dates and things like that. The data set is great. It's, it's over a huge area, but also does include its challenges. Uh, and just very quickly, wet areas mapping has not just been a, done in uh, Alberta. There are a few locations in Canada that have small data sets, and the Swedes have investigated it as well for their own operational use. So here is a data set, uh, two pro three provincial data sets. We've got this red line is a road. We've got a provincially mapped stream here on the left. We've got a, an aerial image. These are data sets that foresters would be very, very familiar with. Here's our beautiful LIDAR DEM. Uh, more and more forest co forestry companies are at a minimum at least looking at a digital elevation model hill shade, which is great because it gives you a different perspective on the landscape. Although we do have to remember that photogrammetrists can look at, at, at uh, imagery in 3D. Here we have our wet areas mapping data, our depth to water estimates. And so you can see, and I think Nicholas showed this slide, but you can see just how these, ver just looking at these data sets, it can be a very, very powerful thing when you're thinking about how you want to operate on the landscape. So fundamentally, we have four data sets that come out of wet areas mapping that I'll, I'll talk about. We have our flow direction raster. So I mentioned that we collect LIDAR data at one meter resolution. So for every single meter, square meter on the landscape, we know which way water flows to. We use a very simple algorithm for wet areas mapping. It's called a D8 algorithm. So it is cannot map model dispersion. It can't say water will go this way and this way simultaneously. With the D8, it can only go one way. So that's arguably a limitation, but Jay, who is the developer of wet areas mapping, found that the D8 algorithm was simple, but it was also the most robust. Uh, from flow direction, we can, start to cal we can start to estimate flow accumulation. Flow accumulation tells you how much water is being, con how much upstream up area is contributing water to any given point. So again, it's one meter by one meter cell. From there, we have, we develop our predicted streams. We say if more than four hectares is contributing water to this square meter, we're going to initiate a stream, a synthetic or predicted stream. So we have to really remember that just because we have a, a wet areas mapping stream on a map, it doesn't mean that there's channelization. But we think that during a wet year, assuming you have relatively impermeable surface, you'll have water flowing down this stream, this stream. I shouldn't say channel. So it may be an intermittent uh, stream with no channelization. And one of the recent, uh, some of the recent work that Jay has done is to actually attribute that stream. So you're not just looking at a line on a map. So it'll have every segment now has upstream and downstream linkages, the, the straw or stream order, uh, upstream and downstream contributing areas, uh, and things like sinuosity, which geomorphologists and fisheries guys love. So 
the key is now you don't just have this blue line on a map. You have a data set that even if you had no other, if you had no other LiDAR data, the stream network itself now has a lot of attributed information. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, on the left we have our official ESRD hydro layer, photo interpreted. And I don't, I want to be careful here because I don't want to be too, I don't want to seem negative when it comes to this layer because I've walked around the forest. And these interpreters are really, really good at what they do within the limits of the data sets they have. So I've sta John Stat and I a few months ago stood in a, uh, a little draw that the photo interpreters caught and you know, I have absolutely no idea how they, how they identified it, but um, the reality is that they can't see everything. And so on the right, we have our where areas mapping predicted stream channels. And you can just see the incredible difference. So if you're an operator on the landscape and you have to make decisions about where you want to establish a footprint, which data set do you want? And then here, the, the, from the stream channels, we, we can then move to the, our depth to water estimates. So Nicholas also talked about it. It's an estimate of the uh, water table, the, its depth from, or its distance from ground height. Uh, it's in, very simply, we have a, an array of blues. So I think even my toddler son would get that more blue is more water, or you know, a lower depth to water. And then we have some test pits. These are real test pits that were dug in by people in the field. So our deep blues where we have you know, our depth to water of zero to 10 centimeters, the pits, we dig them, they fill up pr just about, you know, if not immediately over overnight. And then we transition into the drier areas. So, and again, Nicholas mentioned, you can also flip that on its side and start thinking of wet areas mapping as a dry areas map. And we've been approached by a few consulting companies working for forestry companies that have asked for you know, how they can actually do that to plan harvesting, during, like summer harvest. The process really that Jay goes through is he starts with a digital surface model. So this is looking not just at the bare earth, but the entire LiDAR data set. He takes that and he assembles a digital elevation model, so the bare earth, no vegetation. He develops the pr predicted streams, which were in turn uh, estimated using the flow direction and flow accumulation rasters. And then they do the depth to water estimates. Fairly straightforward. You actually don't need Jay Ogilvy at UNB to do a lot of this stuff. You can use white box if you're GIS savvy. So what I'm going to start talking about now is some of the added, um, the innovation that has gone on at UNB to really make this product uh, separate from the rest. Oh, and of course, our depth to water es estimates here gives you an idea. So the two issues that we've run into, or well, I can't say we, but Jay, Barry, and Paul have run into in the last decade have been related to hydro conditioning and treed bogs. So I'll go through both of those. The idea behind hydro conditioning, and I think I alluded to this earlier, is when you're working with a one meter DEM, it's just way too much information. You have decimeter error, honestly, under forest canopy, more than decimeter error in your DEM and that results in pits and hills and little lumps and bumps in the forest. And really, frankly, if you walk through a forest, it's not perfectly flat anyways. So when you want to start modeling this stuff, you actually have to clean up those little pits. We also have issues around damming with, at roadsides. So a road may have a culvert in it, but the LiDAR data can't see that culvert. So what do you do there? And then another issue we have is I mentioned that rivers, water, wet areas can absorb this near infrared laser pulse. And so we have actually have issues around modeling how streams move or how streams are contoured, their, their morphology. And so how do we make those look more natural? So the hydro conditioning involves some pre-filling and some breaching and then two breaching algorithms. One we call the anthropogenic breaching and one called natural breaching. So I like to think of the filling as basically, my dad's a cabinet maker and he gets, he is very cheap and so he goes out and he gets the, you know, this horrible looking like two by sixes, alder, uh, alder two by sixes and uh, you can't run your hand down them because your hand, you would just be slivers. So the process he goes through is to fill and smooth this, this wood. And this is exactly what you do with a DEM. You effectively polish it by filling sinks. So here you have a sink, a depression. And the computer, if it's wet, modeling how water flows across, across the landscape, it doesn't know that it needs to go through this sink. It just stops there. 
So what we do is we can fill the sink, and you can think of that as your wood filler. And then we can also breach, so we can remove some of these, these pits. So you can think of that as sanding down your surface, so that you get a beautiful sort of polished digital surface mo elevation model. Here's an example that Jay provided. I think he filled sinks to a depth of five centimeters. So if you have a sink that's five centimeters or less, it gets filled and uh, it fills on this, in this example, for almost 40,000. The next thing he has to do is breach roads. So there may be culverts on a road, but we don't know it. So you get watered pooling uh, on a road side. And so what he does is he, use a he uses a very aggressive algorithm to figure out where water should be moving and then to cut the road. So that's usually done manually and you, it's pretty straightforward to do if you have good culvert data. If you have bad culvert data, then you have to start doing an automated process like this. And then finally, we have our natural breaching. So this is, this step is not to be underestimated because it takes an incredible amount of computing time. Uh, it's a much gentler uh, algorithm that actually looks at the entire landscape and tries to figure out how water should move across it. And uh, it takes literally weeks. And the flatter the area, the, wor the longer it takes because the algorithm has to figure out how water wants to move downhill. Um, and this is a really the number one step or the number one time killer for us. If you ask for a study area uh, to be processed, and we're usually very, very happy to provide it to you. But if it's flat, you don't expect a call back for a few months. If it's in the foothills, it's a different story. We know which way water runs downhill. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. The other challenge that with this algorithm is because we, the LiDAR data is so large, we can't, ha we can't process it all at once. We have to look at tiles, adjacent tiles that overlap. And when the, so the breaching algorithm looks at adjac adjacent tiles, but it lo it's looking at the landscape in context. But the landscapes are different, different between the tiles, so you can actually get different results. And Jay has really probably spent a year pulling his hair out trying to, to solve that problem. And so anyways, you add your, the end result of your hydro conditioning, so your filling, your anthropogenic breaching, and your natural breaching is what we hope is a beautiful flow network. And I just want to highlight this stream, this meandering stream here, which was a bit of a horror show because we had so much missing data and the algorithm didn't know how to handle it. And that anthropogenic breaching just did a beautiful job of properly modeling those, the, the, the meanders. And then from there, we do our depth to water estimates. And here's just two examples, the filled and breached DEMs. So you can really see how uh, the DEM on the right is the final hydro conditioned product is you know, a nice polished polished surface. A few years ago, this is the second bit of innovation that I really want to talk about today, the, which is classifying treed bogs. I'll tell a story here very briefly. A few years ago, Jay and Barry went out in the forest. They had just recently transitioned from modeling, doing wet areas mapping on the foothills, which is easy because water moves downhill, to modeling, uh, applying wet the wet areas mapping algorithm to uh, the boreal forest, when we know that the boreal forest is covered in raised peat bogs, treed peat bogs. Uh, they looked at their initial output, and this is always the danger in remote sensing and GIS, falling in love with your maps and believing it to be true. And then they went out into the forest and walked it, and they were walking areas that the wet areas map, mapping algorithm predict predicted should be dry and their feet were soaking wet. So. What was the problem? The problem is that the algorithm is modeling these raised peat plateaus as dry areas because they're above the surrounding landscape. And imagine at the time Barry was unionized and he was probably pretty happy about that because they had to put the whole project on hold for two years while they developed uh, a workaround for this. So this is again, this is where the digital surface model comes in, the, or the canopy height model. and. Uh, Intense, an intensity image. LiDAR has an intensity, can give you intensity values. So what they really rely on is the, they start to experiment with these three data sets. And I will, all I will say about intensity using intent, intensity does not work. It is not a stable product. Uh, many of you may have seen LiDAR intensity surfaces, but they are very, very unreliable. They differ by sensor. The sensor, if it has a hiccup during flight, can actually, you can actually radic get radically different 
uh, intensity values between flight lines. So that was tossed out the window. I think Jay probably lost three months of his life coming to grips with that. But what Jay settled on was using texture. So it turns out these treed bogs have unique textures when you look at um, the, the canopy height model and digital elevation models in combination. And so what he was actually able to do was model the, tech, the, two tex the textures from these two surfaces and, and sort of make guess or predict where these treed bogs will be. One issue around using the canopy height models is that our LIDAR data is collected over a number of years, mostly, most of it comes from you know, between 2006 all the way to 2014. But more problematically, and this is a really something that's key in remote sensing, is it comes from different seasons. So when we collect multiple data sets, it's often fine that it's from different years, but you want it to be, from, phenologically, you want it to be similar. You want it to be from the same season. And that's just not the case with our data. About half of it's leaf on, about half of it's leaf off. It really changes some of the structure metrics we get from our point cloud data and changes the nature of the canopy height model. Anyways, Jay was able to work around that, so I'll just show you. Here we have our digital elevation model. And then here we have the, uh, the classified treed bogs. And then we apply our before and after wet area mapping estimates. And you can tell they're just radically, radically different. And most reports say from the boreal, much, much better. And just I want to make clear that it wasn't just Jay sitting in his office in front of his computer making pretty maps. This is a campaign actually has involved, or the, the initiative has involved this very serious field campaign. Most of the field work was done around between 2008 and 2012. And it literally involved a lot of grad students out in the forest, foothills and boreal, uh, mapping you know, with a differentially corrected GPSs, mapping these wet areas features. And they've come up, the statistic we have, the valid, accuracy, accuracy statistic we have is our predicted stream channel network is probably within five meters, most of, usually within five meters of where we think it is. And keep in mind, five meters is a, not a satisfying number because the di a differ differentially corrected GPS under forest canopy has its own error as well. So we say it's five meters, plus or minus five meters, 75% of the time. So this summer in Conklin was f in 2011 was 400 plots alone. And here's just an example of a um, clear cut that I walked a few months ago up near White Court, and we have the old wet areas mapping model on the left and the new on the right with the bog algorithm. And um, there were some issues. We found a couple issues in the site. You know, we wanna, one of the things we're really, really interested in with wet areas mapping is the idea behind connectivity and figuring out how these wet areas connect with each other. But we're also very interested in vernal pools. So where are these isolated wet areas? And um, uh, in this site, we actually missed one of those, wet, wet, those isolated wet areas. So the model is very much a model. It's not perfect. But at the same time, 50 meters away, we're walking an area, and it's literally bang on. We're standing there with our differentially corrected GPS, and the transition zone is between our legs on the map. It was just incredible. So our next step in terms of where we want to go with the WAM is the development of improving flow, how we estimate flow accumulations. So the, the, entire, the whole thing is based on flow accumulations and good estimates of flow accumulations. But the issue is you, you're limited into by commute, computer memory, basically, in terms of how big an area you can compute a flow accumulation for. So what we're talking about is actually, and if you have an edge, if your drainage basin is cut in half because you have no data, you can't get accurate flow accumulations either. So what we're talking about is a way to, de is the development of an algorithm to effectively contribute or calculate flow accumulations over an unlimited area at you know one meter, 10 meter spatial resolution. And so really what we want to do is a be able to address those edge effects using different DEM sources to at least come up with a, a rough estimate so that we can improve those accumulation estimates on the border drainage basins. So it's a bit of a, it's hard to explain and it's um, a bit arcane, but it's actually a real problem when you, when you want to do this kind of mo modeling. I'll bre very briefly touch base on, with the, uh, the, on the spill tool. It was uh, one of the 
a parallel outcome or development with the Wet Areas Mapping Initiative out of University of New Brunswick. And really what it's for is to estimate how a, a spill or a fluid that is emanating from a point source will move across a landscape. So it's actually a very sophisticated tool in that you can feed it um, things like uh, fluid viscosity and discharge amounts, and then it will predict how that fluid will move across the landscape, and it will time it as well. So it'll tell you if, you, if, if it's been flowing for six hours at this discharge rate, you know, you'll find this much fluid at this location. They're having real issues with the timing, but it's usually, you can at least get order of magnitude estimates. It has been used by uh, operationally a few times in Alberta. Um, the one spill that comes to mind was an incident that happened near Fort McMurray. There was uh, some diesel fluid that was spilled off a road. And uh, these guys were literally walking through the snow with sticks, trying to figure out how this diesel flu fluid had dispersed across the landscape underneath the snow. And they were able to use the spill tool to get a, a better map so that they could clean it up. And then here's the Nexon spill that just happened a few months ago. Yeah, that was in the news. Uh, we weren't exactly sure where the spill emanated from, so uh, Paul and Jay were able did several runs. But it allows you can see how it allows you to actually look at the landscape and play play with different scenarios. And in this case, the uh, actual spill was here, and you can see it moves down this pipeline and then into this small lake and then across the pipeline again and back into this small lake and it keeps going. It turns out though that our DEM was old, so none of this is true, it's all theoretical. We, uh, the DEM, these companies often update their DEM on a, on a very frequent basis, and so they had berms in place that we didn't, that we didn't have in our DEM, but you get the idea for the, how the tool could be useful in Alberta. So in summary, wet areas mapping is uh, Fundamentally, it's a hydrological risk tool. That's how we've always thought about it. But I think as we're going to see today, it's actually leading to a lot of innovation. And uh, the remainder of the day, I hope, will be far more interesting than the sort of nuts and bolts examples that I've been talking about. Um, just a reminder that this stuff does not allow us to sit in our offices. We actually have to get out there in the field. But I think it makes the time we spend in the field a lot more efficient. and. Um, a lot more effective. So thanks for your time, guys. Appreciate it.